All right, mate, can you start by saying your name and your job title, please? Lungani Zama, uh, freelance sports journalist and broadcaster in South Africa. Beautiful. We're going to go straight into our crossover episode here, man. Uh, Temba Bavuma, South African captain, not selected for his team's domestic league. That's, I mean, personally for him, I've already seen some of his comments. He must be absolutely gutted. That's such an embarrassing thing to have happen to you. Yeah, that's the word, embarrassing. I think um, you can try and butter it up however you want, but when you're the captain of a T20 team and players that most of the country hasn't heard of um, get signed up and, and you somehow don't make it, 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 it it's, a tough, it's a tough pill to swallow. Uh, from, I mean, it looks like almost, and I know you've looked into this a lot already, it seems to me that the most obvious thing is he probably priced himself out of that. And that he's not, weirdly enough, more often than not, when you look at these auctions and these drafts around the world, more, when a big name player doesn't go, it's quite often more to do with the amount that they put them for, themselves for rather than the fact that everyone's like, oh, he's terrible. You know, it's usually, oh, well, this person it thinks he's worth this. Actually, no one in this league at the moment thinks he's worth that money. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. And I think... You know, in the cold light of day, Temba and Adile Petluguayo and anyone else in that national squad who didn't make it, that was the basis. You, you price yourself out of the market right out the gate. And, you know, Cricket South Africa and the organizers had said to all the players, you know, set your, set your bar low so you get in. You know, ideally we want every single contracted player in. And Temba and Andile were one of those who said, no, we'll set our base price at 850000 which is almost a million bucks. Um, and that's the risk you take. And unfortunately, it hasn't paid off. Um, and you've got you to you know, basically juggle whether coming in low and being signed up for 250000 Rand is better than not being signed at all. Uh, and, 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 and that's the question they've got to look at and face uh, this morning. Yeah, I mean, both of those plays are really interesting, actually, on that particular. One. We'll stick with Temba just because I think on a very basic thing, I, so I've done a bit of a historical search, right, <laughs> to try and work out if there's ever been another captain of an international team who wasn't good enough to be in the domestic league. And if you think about it from non-T20 point of view, Mike Brearley is probably someone that if there was like a super domestic league in England, there's no way that Mike Brearley is probably getting into any of those teams. He would have in those days because they would have just picked him because everyone thought he was a great captain, right? But realistically on talent and everything else, they, you know, this, if, if, if England cricket suddenly had the eight best um, sides in a one-day competition in 1980, Mike Brearley's not getting in unless he's literally wearing the blazer, right? So that, that's the most obvious one I could think of. There's another one. Do you remember Lee Jamon? the New Zealand player who came from outside the team to captain it. But I went back and had a look at his records. He was actually a really good hitter. There's no way domestically he's missing out, right? So I think Lee Jamon um, doesn't quite qualify. The one that I came up with was Tim Payne. Now that's obviously a bit weird, right? Because in some ways he only became captain by accident, right? And wasn't supposed to be there and should never have really, I don't think he should have been playing in the T20 team, let alone being captain of it in, in the end. It's a little bit similar here, though. Bavoom is really the captain because they kind of cycled through everyone else. And there wasn't, you know, he was the last man standing at a certain point, I think, as well. But realistically, at least with Tim Payne, it, it came on the back of Sandpaper Gate and everything else. Because you're really saying, if you think about it mathematically, and he's a specialist batter, right? If you've got this, you think about how many people are, are contracted, you're really suddenly saying he's not in the best 30 to 40 specialist batters in T20 cricket in the country. That's that's a huge slap in the face. I know we're not quite saying that because it is slightly financial, but that has got to be, for Cricket South Africa and for Timber himself, that's got to be a bit of a shock. Yeah, it is a shock. Uh, you know, when you put it that way, it, it is a shock. It's saying out of all the players who purely bet, we don't rate you. Um, but like you say, there is a bit of a caveat in the sense that it's specialist batsmen, but there's a financial implication as well, which was in his control and he's chosen to go that way. Um, but yeah, it's it, your national captain not making a tournament. But I will also say that we, we can call this a domestic league, but it's fully Indian owned. Mm. Um, so it is Indian 
funders who've come in at tens of millions of dollars and there are no stipulations about the team that in you know, the makeup of the squad it's it's an auction and a lot of the coaches are local and they would have had advice and they would have looked at records and they would have looked at a lot of you know uh, circumstances and the fact that none of those have bit um probably says to you that you know the price was the deterring factor here um because you don't want to you don't want to be paying a million bucks for somebody that you clearly don't rate in terms of being your firepower if you're trying to to play attacking cricket so then if we somebody who's going to add value in the change room you know i heard a a chat with rasi van der dusen and he said his first season of ipl was also very similar where he set the lowest possible base price because he wanted to get in and once you're in it's the only way you can influence the people that are going to select you for match day you you, you show up at practice with a good attitude so you kind of humble yourself because you're dealing with employers who don't know you who don't know the you know the hard yards that you've done domestically for years but you're going to you're going to show up and you're going to be first on the bus and last out of the nets and and all those things and now you know at, even though he doesn't play regularly he's a regular IPL contract mm. contracted player and that's what you're dealing with you're dealing with people who don't know you who don't know what maybe Timba does off the field uh what he means to the team fielding wise they don't care uh you know they've got they've got guys who pick people who are going to influence the power play as strongly as possible and there would have been several names in South African cricket too and international because there were guys like Jason Roy in the mix um and they would have looked at them and said they're going to pose more of a threat than Temba Pavuma and that's that's a tough thing to hear but it's 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 it's, it's you know it's cold facts yeah it also it says a little bit about two things we kind of need to split them up the first one is you and I know that Temba is a really focused sort of inspirational figure is probably the wrong kind of person, but he's, he's that sort of person that when you meet, you're just like, this guy's zoned in, right? Like he, he, he's going to do whatever he can to get the most out of himself. Teammates feel very similar. He's, but he's not known as a great tactician, is he? So if you're mo most people, when they're looking for captains, right, they're looking for, oh, the guy who moves this fielder to here and gets a wicket or the guy who brings on the part-timer and changes the game or uses a pinch hitter and, and, and changes the innings. He's not really known as that sort of person, but from a from an inspiration point of view, and from a lead by example point of view, and from a work ethic point of view, he's actually a really, really good captain. Yeah, exactly. He leads by example. He he's got a great work ethic. He's got a great attitude. He's he's empathetic. Um, but I, I'll say that the warning signals probably started when every franchise named the people that they bought up front and his name wasn't on that list because that kind of tells you where you're going in terms of leadership Josie Super Kings pick Fuff um Aiden Markram and PE Miller and Butler and Paul so you start looking and going these IPL owners have already started picking players that they've worked with before that yeah. they trust in leadership positions so he's not going to be picked as captain so he's going to rest heavily on on what he does as a player uh, so the die was kind of cast then, and then you think, okay, well, he, he's probably going to get picked as as a batsman. Um, but yeah, like you say, tactics in in T Twenty cricket. Stephen Fleming has worked with Faf Duplessis for almost a decade. Miller's made his name, and you know, at Kings Eleven, and then moved on to the Titans. Now, so there's there's very firmly entrenched relationships, and and unfortunately, um, if 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 you're coming in cold and people don't know you, and they've kind of sort of said well we've worked with all these guys in the IPL we're comfortable with what they do we know that they know what we want um it's a tricky one it's a, it's a domestic league but not really you know it's almost a domestic league by zoom you're kind of playing but in your home stadiums but you're playing for bosses who are halfway across the world and if you don't have a relationship with them it's going to be tough to get in yeah I think it also says something about leadership as well because I, I do believe that his kind of leadership is less seen on the field. That's not a slight on him. And, you know, he's still fought quite early on in his captaincy, although I know he did really well domestically at times. But his kind of leadership isn't as obvious, whereas if it was a sort of a Michael Clark or, or Baz McCullum for, form of leadership, it's, like, really obvious. But as you said, you've got owners um, from uh, who, are you, who have relationships with other people who are probably, if they're going to pick a captain for a captain's sake they're probably looking at someone a little bit more dramatic and a little bit more known as, as a great leader than he is do, do you think that there's always been that whole thing with him of like you know that he hates talking about it but the whole quota 
angle where he's still seen as, even though, I mean, I, spoiler alert, but um, uh, I've just done the most improved player awards um, in test cricket over the last two years, and he does very well in those awards. Um, we know how much better he's got over the last two or three years, but there's always been that sort of quota um, and second choice angle to him. Do you think any of that plays with, especially with people who don't know him and, uh, you know, probably don't have any, as you said, don't have any kind of relationship uh, with him? Yeah, it it would be very sad if if one of the considerations was the fact that he is deemed a quota player by in, in some quarters because I think he's made significant strides in showing that he's 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 much more than that, um, and I think it, it, the 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 politics the the the, land, the political landscape of South African cricket is something that people outside South Africa don't understand and, and don't really have time for. So I I don't think it's something that owners would have even considered. Um, but the one thing, having spoken to a couple of sort of fringe coaches or assistant coaches in that setup, is is, is what they said is straight after the the, the auction is that if, if we're not buying him as a frontline player and you're buying him for the sake of it, the pressure then goes on to you as a franchise to say, why did you buy the South African captain and then you don't use him once? Yeah. So at the moment, it's a league problem because he's not been bought by anyone in the league, but it's kind of the league's baby now. But if the Paul Rock or the, the, the Paul Royals buy him and then you don't use him at all, then there's this disgruntlement of the Paul coach, JP Dumini, and the Paul owners and the Paul captaincy and the management. Why didn't you play the national captain? So I think that hot potato was kind of left in the table because it's is not going to become our problem that we have to deal with on the side. We, we saw weird things in the 100 auction too, I think. I'm trying to remember what the exact contracts were, but you needed to have players. So Rory Burns ends up siding with the um, Oval Invincibles because he's a Surrey player and because he's an you know he's an, uh, an England player at that, that time. And it looks stupid, right? When you know best those going to Wales and you know all these gun players are playing, uh, you know are the first choice players, uh, you know in the hundred, and then you've got Rory Burns, who we all know is he's a handy t20 player in, in a blast situation when you've got 18 teams but in the 100 it was like what's rory burns going to be able to do nick the ball through second slip all day long right so it does feel that perhaps uh the south african officials and and i think this i i think this is a very fair criticism of them they came up with this idea they knew that it was going to be this huge rush of money and they thought perhaps they could manage the um, overseas owners slightly differently and almost from straight away the overseas owners have been very clear as you said they're completely running the show and because of that south africa probably didn't put or cricket south africa probably didn't put enough safeguards in to make sure that things like this didn't happen no look uh, uh cricket south africa has got a lot wrong over the last few years but in, in this instance just to really clarify this point because this eight hundred and fifty thousand number is not is not a random number yeah they guaranteed every single national player that even if you, Jared, come in at 175 as your base price and you get bought for 175, we will make up the surplus so you get 850 out of the tournament because we want all our players there. Yeah. But we'd like you to set your base price at low as possible so that you're in the conversation. But if you set your base at what is our optimum that we're comfortable paying all of you just in case all 17 of you don't get bought, then you taking the risk, but we'd like you to manage the risk a little bit because we want you all there trying to avoid this exact situation. Yeah. I, Lo and behold. Yeah. I get what you're saying. And Dile and Timber. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I don't, there's, there's two things that haven't factored in there. One is that you and I have spent our entire lives around professional athletes and we both know that ego is a huge part of it. And what the England system did with the hundred is take the ego out. Right. It was literally, no one, I don't even know if people knew how much of those players were played or, or, or whatever that situation was. Um, but, but, you, but you're not wrong. I'm not saying that they didn't try and, and fix this. They obvi obviously, especially, you know, we, we talked about Temba, but with Andili, they probably wouldn't have even assumed that he wouldn't have been picked up. I mean, he is uh, a good uh, T20 player and, and we've seen that, especially domestically. There's no reason why that wouldn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I completely um, get what you're going with there. Here's my question for you. Is Temba Bavuma a T20 player anyway? Regardless of the fact that he, it, it goes back to almost the Tim Payne comment from before of uh, Tim Payne was probably a T20 player was, when he was young. 
right? By the time he was actually a T20 player for Australia, yeah, as captain, he certainly wasn't a T20 player anymore, but had to do it because of circumstances. I, I look at Temba and have for a very long time as they have pushed him in test cricket and they've used him a lot in T20 cricket. They almost never used him in ODI cricket for years, despite the fact that that is the most natural fit for his skill sets, running between the wickets, getting off strike, um, you know, hustling, scoring 40 to 60s over and over again. It seems like he was perfect for that. For whatever reason, through selection and through the team setup, they've never done it. I've never thought to myself, he is a T20 player. We've seen him make massive strides in the test game over the last couple of years. Um, but do you think he's a T20 player? Look, to be completely honest, from, from the very beginning when the captaincies were announced, my first concern was the format that Temba Bavuma is best suited to is test cricket. I thought he was going to be the ideal test captain. And, and once you, you make him T20 and one day captain, you kind of force your hand because to drop your captain that you've picked is weird. But his most natural format is test cricket. And we've seen how much he's been missed in the test team in England when he wasn't there. So T20, the way that it's evolved, especially in domestic leagues, they, you know, people want to go out of the gates, you know, at 100 miles an hour. And that's why Stubbs got the money that he got. That's why Deploy got signed up for what he got signed up. That's why... Jason Roy came back the second time around and got two million rand because if you can get teams away to a fast start, you you set them up for 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 chases. And Temba plays differently. He's more of an accumulator than a destroyer. And I I think he is a T20 player if you're going to build around him. But if you're going to ask him to to score 60 of 30, more often than not he's not. And and I think that's that's what these teams have gone for. They've gone for firepower. And he's not firepower. He's more slow poison. And and that's hurt him. And that's the reputation. Definitely domestically, he's gone through the gears. But you're playing against international, you know, you're going to be playing against Kajisu Rabat and you're going to be playing against Lungingidi. And you're going to be playing against, you know, some, some, some bowlers which you want to take on. And he's not shown that internationally. His strike rate doesn't suggest that it's more of a, an accumulator role and, and bat for 15 overs or so. And I, I suppose... Teams have looked at that and said, what we want is somebody who's going to get us to 60, 70, 80 in the power play. And that's not Temba Bavuma style. That's not what he's shown up to this point. Yeah, I think there is definitely, and look, I don't know how much the teams involved use data in this particular case because uh, it's not the IPL. There isn't as much money. How much of it, it? It's interesting that they went with so many guys who like to hit. It's almost like they're trying to groom players for the IPL rather than get the best players available in certain situations when you look at some of some of these squads, right? But uh, you look at his international numbers and he averages just under 27. So he's not batting a long period of time when he plays internationally with a strike rate of 120. That's not a good T20 player because he's not giving you the high average and the consistency, and he's also striking way too slow. Interestingly enough, though, as you would uh, as you would assume I would do, man, I went a little bit deeper. And the thing I was really interested about was how good he is in South Africa, right, compared to a lot of the guys who, who obviously were drafted. So if you look at his stats in South Africa, this is all the batters in South Africa with over 500 runs in the last three years. He averages 35 with a strike rate of 129. That's basically, I think he's a little bit slower than Heinrich Klassen, but a similar average. But he's actually got a far better record than Reza Hendricks, right? Now, Klassen's a wicketkeeper, and we knew he was going to go for money. Reza Hendricks is a really interesting one because he's sort of become more seen as a very good T20 player over the last year, year and a half. But traditionally, he's also a very slow player. And he's averaging less. Oh, sorry, he's averaging about the same, a little bit less, I think, and striking less. So. I'm assuming that Reza didn't go for big money and probably did uh, follow that sort of thing and, and put himself in at a bit better number. But it does tell you that Temba's figures domestically are not that far off a few other guys who went in that draft. So he's not like, we're not, we're not talking about a situation where, was it, who was the, um, when Owen Morgan played for Kolkata Knight Riders and he had a strike rate of 102. We're not talking about that level of bad player, are we? We're talking about a player who's like a fringe player, but, but as you said, may not be an automatic starter, even if he was um, taken up on a low contract. Reza Hendricks went for, for big money. Reza Hendricks went for four and a half million rand. Really? Um, and I think, pop, yeah. And I think, you know, 
You remember JP Dumini starting out in the IPL and making 170 at MCG and then mm. sort of taking Australia apart in a couple of T20s just before the very first auction. Timing is everything in, 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 in these tournaments. When you're starting a new team and you, there's a couple of flavor of the month buys, JP Dumini got $900,000 out the gate and everyone was like cheapers. How can he get almost the biggest South African contract? But if you advertise your skills at their best just at the time that people are looking, you're going to get in. And Reza Hendricks has scored four out of five fifties in his last, you know, five yeah, games he, at a time he, when Tembo was injured. Didn't he break a record a great... for the most fifties in a row or something in, in T20 cricket? I can't remember if it was international or domestic, but yeah, you're right. I've, so I commentated on some of those games and I thought he had improved, but um, a couple of those games were, was it, a, I'm trying to remember, was it, Ireland. I'm not saying that Ireland has it. It was Ireland. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, it's not quite elite level is what I'm saying. No, it's not. But I mean, if, 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 if you're saying that you want uh, a South African opening batter, who's familiar with the conditions and he can strike at a decent enough strike rate and he's, he's kind of in form. If Timber's sitting on the bench, not playing because he's injured, unfortunately, and Reza's done four out of five. You kind of go, okay, we can build a team around that because he, he's doing it and he seems to be doing it. He seems to be in good enough nick. Um, you can justify that. And and I think if we, you know, if we take faces out of this and names out of this and we look at current form, if you look at the record of Reza Hendricks against the record of Temba Bavuma, you'd, you'd spend more money on the Reza one. And, and, and that's kind of what's happened. And if you look at Reza's base price, again, you can start the conversation in an auction when you're still at 200,000 rand and, and you kind of go from yeah. there. And then, you know, there's, there's also ego with owners. So some of these numbers that have sort of shot up to four, five, six million, it's become a bun fight between owners who go, no, actually, I don't, I don't want to play against him. And I definitely don't want the Mumbai Indians to get him. I'm, I, I want him. And it becomes that kind of, of, of ego. So yeah, it's, it's a weird one, but how do you explain that? Yeah, I think the whole the whole thing is very interesting as Dan Norcross appears on our feed and then disappears there. Um, <laughs> that's the, the best I've ever heard Dan talk about anything. Yeah, I think th that is the one thing that I think a lot of people forget. Do you remember when Chris Morris went for an absolute fortune just before um, he retired? And there are all these people going, Chris Morris isn't worth that. And it's like, well, actually, he's one of two players in the world who can bowl in the death and slog in the death. So he's actually a fantastic cricketer to have at that period. Um, but realistically, the reason he went for all that money is there were two teams absolutely desperate in the last year of the IPL cycle to get death bowling, right? And you looked at the rest of the names in the world and there was no other guy who had been consistent in the IPL, let alone outside the IPL as a death bowler. So those things happen and I, I can see that. And, and to be honest, I do think that, I do think the Reza has flipped a switch. Maybe he hasn't done it as much domestically, but I do think he's flipped a switch um, as a T20 player over the last, what, probably 18 months um, uh, overall. And the, the interesting thing with that is, I think Bavoom is a much better batter now than he was probably even two or three years ago as well. I think he's got a lot better. We, may, we possibly just haven't seen it in T20 cricket though. Yeah, we have not seen it internationally, but you know, Reza won the trophy for the Lions he he played an unbelievable innings in the 50 over final in our last season where he just shot the lights out and beat the titans almost single handedly so you know he's he's done it in the window that people were looking um and it, you, funny you say morris i spoke to morris as well this louis because he was at the auction and he said these things happen you know you 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 kind of expecting to go for 100,000 dollars and get another gig and go to the you know to to the IPL for two months and kind of play half games and then suddenly exactly what you have is exactly what two teams need and they've got money in the kitty and they've got to spend it and they just go and go and go and i mean you know that story is famous his agent was calling him saying are you watching this he wasn't even watching because he just thought I'll, I'll get something hopefully and next thing two million dollars and you're going cheapest how but skills supply and demand if it's in short supply, players will get bought. And, you know, this is not a race thing because there's guys like Sisanda Magala who's mm. been told he's not fit for international cricket. He was signed for five and a half million because he's the best death bowler in South Africa for the last five years. You only need four, four overs out of him. And PE Super Sunrises PE said, 
that's our guy and, yeah. and, and we're going to go and we're going to get him. He's come on a PE and he's going to play for us and he's got five and a half million. And just to finish the point, I think half the issue and the reaction to Temba is that five and a half million rand is almost three times the salary of an international player anyway. And someone's now going to make it in a month and they don't have a national contract of your, you know, value. It, it, it just, you know, the scales are so very different and it, it hurts because you're not even getting a, a smidgen of that. And someone, you know, Stubbs, who's just starting his international career, is almost getting 10 million bucks. It hurts. It stings as as a professional. If I hear Jared Kimber's earning 20 times more than me and we do the same job, you kind of look at yourself and just cheaper. See? You know, you can't help but compare. Um, so it hurts. I get it. It's a really, really interesting way to ask for a raise live on air. I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, just to finish off, it's funny because you mentioned race because Obviously, Andili and Temba are both black African players. So they're not just colored players. They're literally, you know, and I say colored in the South African terms, not anywhere else in the world. Um, it, but, you know, they're really crucially important to South African cricket. For, from a South Africa, a cricket South Africa point of view, even if you and I slightly disagree with they could have done everything, they certainly tried something, right? It's got to hurt to them. Um, you know, it's embarrassing for Temba, but is it not embarrassing for them that it's two black African players who've missed out? I mean, th there are many other black African players who, as you said, have absolutely cashed in, even ones from outside the, the, the South African setup, right? So it's not as if that that's the problem, but it's still, I, I would think from a cricket South Africa with everything that's been going on in, in cricket South Africa, well, from the history of all cricket, but certainly over the last couple of years, um, that must, that must be a bit of a gut punch to some of the people involved. Yeah, absolute, absolute gut punch. I mean, it, these are these are your poster boys, mm. right? These these are the guys that you've invested significantly, even sometimes when they're out of form, because you believe that they're the best you've got. So when somebody comes and throws a lot of money at you, but they don't throw it at them, it kind of you know makes people question your systems and your selection criteria and your product. You know, it, it, it and and I think that's the thing. It's collective embarrassment that the people that you've believed in and put on front street have been overlooked so publicly it, it hurts it hurts the game uh thank you very much for coming on your podcast um and allowing me to host it for you and um i'll talk to you again very soon